Acer sent us their latest Swift Go 14, and they've been really pushing this whole AI PC concept. But let's be real, AI is getting slapped onto everything these days. It's like hot sauce at a food truck. So the big question on everyone's mind, is the AI PC actually worth your money? Or is it just another marketing gimmick designed to part you from your hard earned cash? Are you really going to benefit from this AI trickery? Or could you just save a few bucks and get a solid laptop without all the AI hype? Well that's what we're here to find out. So buckle up, hit that like button if you're ready, and let's dive in. The Acer Swift Go 14 lives up to its name. It's sleek, slim, and definitely light enough to go wherever you need. At just 14.9mm thick, and weighing in at just 1.32kg, this laptop is pretty much the ultimate travel companion. The design itself is familiar and clean, sticking to that same style was seen on Acer in previous years. Nothing groundbreaking, but hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? One thing I do appreciate though, is the one-handed operating mechanism. It's a small detail, sure, but it makes a big difference when you're juggling a coffee in one hand and your laptop in the other. Plus, the screen opens fully flat, which is great for collaborative work or just showing off that fancy OLED display to your friends. And speaking of the build, the lid flex is very minimal thanks to that rigid aluminum body. It's solid, and Acer kept the design consistent, especially around the vent area, extending the slits all the way along. It's definitely a small touch, but these little details add to its premium feel. Oh, and about those thermals? We'll dive into that in just a bit, so hang tight. Trust me, you want to see how this thing handles the heat. Now for all you IO enthusiasts out there, you're in for a treat. The Swift Go 14 comes with a good selection of ports. On the left, you get two Thunderbolt 4 ports, both support charging, a full-size HDMI 2.1 port, and a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port. Flipping around over to the right side, there's another USB port, a headphone mic combo jack, and even a micro SD card slot. That's nice to see, especially since micro SD card slots are becoming as rare as a unicorn in a shopping mall. Moving on to the keyboard and trackpad, it's the typical Ace affair. Solid, reliable, and nothing that will blow your socks off. But it gets the job done. If you've used an Acer keyboard before, you'll feel right at home here. There's no weird spacing issues or any awkward key placement, which is always a win in my book. Now Acer did try to spice things up with some multimedia macro buttons that light up on the keyboard whenever you open YouTube or some other multimedia app. It's a cool idea on paper, but I couldn't help but think that, did we really need this? It's like adding a spoiler to a minivan. It's not really necessary. You can turn it off if it annoys you, which it probably will after the novelty wears off. But here's the kicker, there's an entire key dedicated to Microsoft Copilot. And Acer seems pretty proud of this feature, but honestly why? Just another button that I'll probably never use. Instead, I would have preferred a better placement of the Swift logo, or even the ability to control the brightness on the fly from the keyboard. Missed opportunities Acer, missed opportunities. Now let's talk about the real star of the show, and that's the screen. This is where the Swift Go 14 really shines, literally. It's an OLED display with a 90Hz refresh rate, with a 100% DCI P3 color gamut, and a million to one contrast ratio. Translation? It looks absolutely stunning. Whether you're editing videos, doing some photo work, or just binge watching your favorite shows, the screen does not disappoint. It also boasts a 16 by 10 aspect ratio with an 1800p resolution, making it perfect for creators and media consumption alike. Acer also claims that the screen can hit 400 nits of peak brightness. Not the brightest I've ever seen, but it's more than enough for most use cases. Although be aware that it is quite reflective, so working outside on a sunny day might be challenging. Now let's get to the webcam and microphone setup. Acer actually surprised me here with the 1440p Quad HD webcam on a laptop of this price. That's almost unheard of, but then I actually used it. And well, let's just say that the resolution might be high, but the quality is absolutely all over the place. The video looks washed out and the colors are practically non-existent. It's not the worst that I've seen, but it's definitely not blowing any minds. Although what lacks in video quality, makes up with its AI features. Automatic framing, eye contrast adjustments, background blur, all powered by the AI capabilities of the Intel Ultra Processor. It sounds great on paper, but in reality, I found myself turning most of these features off. The triple firing microphones, on the other hand, do a decent job with good clarity and noise reduction. Perfect for Zoom calls or shouting at your team during a heated game of Warzone. The speakers, well, they're about what you would expect from a Nasa laptop. They're dual firing with DTSX technology, and they get the job done. 
Don't expect to be blown away though, but they're good enough for YouTube videos, Netflix, or casual listening. If you're an audiophile though, you want to plug in some headphones or connect a Bluetooth speaker. Alright, let's get into the meat of this AI PC talk. The SwiftGo 14 is powered by Intel's Ultra 7 155H processor, which has some interesting AI tricks up its sleeve. We've already mentioned the Copilot key, purified view and purified voice features, but it doesn't stop there. Acer also included Live Art, which can instantly remove the background of an image for editing, and Alter View, which creates an AI enhanced background with parallax effect. It's fancy, but do you really need it? Probably not. And here's the rub. Most of this AI stuff feels like fluff. Sure, it's cool that you can mess around with AI features in GIMP or use OpenVINO plugins, but the average user, they're really not gonna care. The software just really isn't there yet, nor is there any real incentive to shell out the extra cash for features you're likely to use once and forget about. In fact, when you compare this model to the previous generation, you're paying around $500 more for the privilege of owning an AI PC. And for what? A handful of gimmicky features that sound good in a press release, but don't really add much value to the everyday user. I mean, Acer literally mentioned the word AI over 30 times on their website for this laptop. It's clear where their priorities are, and let's just say it's not in performance at all. Before we delve into the performance and thermal benchmarks, let's do a quick rundown of the specs. This thing is packed with Intel's Ultra 7 155H. Now for graphics, it of course contains Intel's Arc integrated graphics with 8 XE cores. Not exactly a gaming beast, but we'll see how this thing handles lighter titles. Other than that, you get 16GB of LPDDR5X RAM, a 512GB SSD, and of course, Wi-Fi 7. And lastly, the battery is a lithium-ion 65Wh battery. Now let's talk power and thermals, kicking things off with some real-world tests. We ran Cyberpunk 2077 at native resolution with ultra settings and XESS set to quality. The CPU and GPU, as you can see, show a clear correlation in relation to power, which highlights Intel's dynamic power sharing. The CPU overall draws 45 watts, while the integrated GPU hovers around 14 watts. Looking at temperatures though, yeah, well, yikes. The CPU hits a scorching 100 degrees pretty much all the time, and the clocks are absolutely all over the place. In fact, at several points, the E cores had a higher clock speed than the P cores, which is absolutely disappointing. Not a good look, Acer. Not a good look. The GPU fares slightly better with an average of 84 degrees overall, but the performance in terms of clock speed is pretty inconsistent. And this could be Intel's dynamic power sharing, as I said before, trying to balance things out. But whatever the case, it's not exactly smooth sailing. In Cinebench R23, the CPU can stretch its legs a bit more, hitting a peak of around 67 watts, an average 47 watts. But we can see very clearly it dips down to 26 watts, which indicates some serious thermal throttling. And looking at thermals, it's pretty much the same story for Cyberpunk for the CPU, but even worse. As you can see, the equals pretty much all of the time outclock the P equals, while the CPU sat around 101 degrees for the entire 10 minute run. The bottom line is this. The thermal performance is disappointing, and while I wouldn't really blame Acer entirely, Intel's Media Lake architecture seems to be the real culprit, it's clear that this laptop is not built to handle heavy workloads without getting a bit hot under the collar. Taking off the back panel, the thermal design is well interesting. Right off the bat it uses a dual fan setup, but the fans are actually pretty small, and there's already dust starting to settle. Not a good sign. Personally, I think a single more larger fan would have been a much better choice to improve airflow and reduce dust accumulation. The heatsink is a dual heat pipe design with decent thermal paste application, but it's nothing to write home about. Now let's talk upgradability, or lack thereof. With only a single NVMe slot and soldered RAM, you're not going to be doing much upgrading here. The network card is swappable, but it's already Wi-Fi 7, so there's not really much point. The 65 watt hour battery takes up a good chunk of space, which does help with battery life, but it sacrifices upgradability. You win some, you lose some. Speaking of battery life, this is where the Swift Go 14 shines a bit brighter. In our tests, it lasted almost three and a half hours on idle, and about 10 hours while running basic apps and video playback. 
then 9.3 hours with modern office applications, and about 2 hours while gaming. Not bad at all. Those lower power cores definitely help squeeze out extra juice, so if you're doing everyday tasks, this thing will last all day. Gaming though, you better keep that charger handy. Not that you would be gaming on a laptop like this. Alright, the moment you've all been waiting for, the benchmarks. Let's see how this thing performs. In Puget Bench for the Adobe Suite, the Swift Go 14 performs respectively, holding its own against some of the more expensive gaming laptops with dedicated GPUs. It does fall behind a bit in Premiere Pro compared to the older Swift X 2021, but overall it's not bad. In the Procyon Office benchmarks, it again sits comfortably in the middle with consistent performance across Excel, PowerPoint and Word. It outperforms the Swift X and nearly catches up to the Cyborg 15 and Nitro 5, but it's clear that there's a limit to what this laptop can do, especially in comparison to those gaming rigs. Blender results are about what you would expect. The Swift Go 14 keeps pace with the Nitro 5 and Cyborg 15 on shorter tasks, but falls behind on some of the longer renders. It's a respectable effort, but those thermal limitations are starting to show. And for those developers out there, compiling Chromium took about 224 seconds. While we couldn't compare directly to some of the other models, I'd wager it falls right in the same middle ground. In Cinebench R23, the Swift Go 14 is neck and neck with the Cyborg 15, but falls short against the Nitro 5 in single threading performance. Showing that Media Lake's IPC improvements are not exactly groundbreaking. GPU wise, the Intel Arc i GPU surprised me. It's of course not going to win any awards, but it outpaces a GTX 1650 in some benchmarks, which is impressive given the circumstances. Again, don't expect to be playing AAA games at ultra settings on this thing. Lastly is the storage performance, and it's a bit of a letdown. The Swift X edges it out here, but it's not a huge difference, just something to keep in mind if fast storage is a priority for you. Alright guys, here's the burning question. Can you actually game on an AI PC, like the Swift Go 14? Well let's find out. First up we tested Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p on the low preset, with XES set to audio. We averaged around 36 FPS, with 1.1% 1 .1 lows dropping to 22 and 12 FPS respectively. Not exactly buttery smooth, but hey, for a non-gaming laptop, it's at least playable. With some tweaking to the graphics settings, and maybe a little luck, you might squeeze out a few extra frames. But don't expect miracles. Next up we loaded up Counter-Strike 2, which is a more suitable match for this kind of machine given its lower system requirements. Running again at 1080p on the lowest possible settings, with FSR set the performance, we saw a pretty solid 89 FPS on average. Sounds good right? Well hold on, because the 1% lows took a nosedive to 35 FPS, and the 0.1% lows? Well that hits a rock bottom of 4 FPS. Yeah, that's not exactly the smooth experience you want, especially when you're in a high stakes shootout. But hey, credit where credit is due, getting close to that 90Hz refresh rate on this laptop isn't bad for an integrated GPU. Then we switched things up with Baldur's Gate 3 at the lowest possible settings and FSR 2.2 set the ultra performance. We managed to get an average FPS of 55, while the 1.1% lows were similar to CS2's hitting around 35 and 5 FPS respectively. Again, not a world class gaming experience experience but certainly playable. So if you're okay with some dips in performance here and there, it's by far not the worst way to experience Baldur's Gate. And lucky last is Forza Horizon 5. We decided to push the Swift Go 14 a bit here, by bumping the settings up to a high preset and setting XCSS to balance. Surprisingly, the laptop held up pretty well, delivering a respectable 40 FPS on average, and even more impressive is the 1.1% senders, which weren't far behind at 34 and 32 FPS respectively. This consistency makes Forza Horizon 5 one of the more stable gaming experiences on this machine. So there you have it, the game performance of the Swift Go 14. Intel's improvements with their integrated GPUs, especially in the Arc lineup, do shine through here. And yes, you can game on an AI PC, just don't expect it to replace a dedicated gaming laptop. Alright, let's bring it all together. So is the Asus Swift Go 14 worth your money? And is this whole AI PC concept really beneficial? Well here's the scoop. The Swift Go 14 does a lot of things right. It's sleek, lightweight, and has a solid build quality, perfect for those of you who are always on the move. And the OLED display is a definite highlight, offering vibrant colors and sharp contrasts that make it a pleasure for media consumption and creative work. The battery life is also impressive for everyday use thanks to those low power cores. But when it comes to those AI features, that's where things start to feel more like a marketing ploy than a genuine leap forward. 
Yes, there are some AI powered enhancements like the background removal and dynamic image adjustments. But let's be real guys, these features are niche at best and feel often gimmicky. For most of us, these won't add significant value to our daily use, especially considering the extra cost. The software ecosystem and practical applications for AI laptops just aren't there yet to make it a must have feature. Performance wise, the Swift Go 14 holds its own in many tasks and even some creative workloads. However, once you start to push it with some gaming or heavy multitasking, it really starts to show its limitations. The thermal management just isn't quite up to par, and the AI branding doesn't translate to better performance in a way that's noticeable for the average user. So should you buy the Swift Go 14? Well, if you're looking for a portable, stylish laptop for everyday tasks, like content creation and casual gaming, it could be a good fit. But if you're especially interested in an AI PC, you might want to hold off. The extra cost for those AI capabilities doesn't offer enough to justify the price, especially when compared to similar models that don't carry the AI label, but offer comparable or even better performance. Now this doesn't mean that all AI laptops are robust, or that the concept isn't promising, far from it. We're at a very early stage of seeing what AIs and MPUs can do in the consumer laptop space. Future iterations like the upcoming Lunar Lake SOCs from Intel might very well make AI a compelling feature, but as of now, it feels like we're still waiting for the software and real world applications to catch up with the hardware capabilities. So the bottom line is this, the Swift Go 14 is a decent laptop with some nice features, but don't let the AI buzzword be the deciding factor for your purchase. Make sure to subscribe and hit that bell if you want to stay updated on these new releases. We've got plenty more coming your way. Thanks for sticking around and as always, drop your comments in the comment section below and I'll catch you in the next one.